according to our Vaishnava calendar, it is the particular day of the year where we honor Bhishma Dev. That great personality who taught the world for all time to come how to perfect one's life at the moment of death. Lord Chaitanya emphasized a particular sloka as having ultimate importance. Mahajano yena katasa panta. One cannot understand Krishna or achieve the perfection of life by undergoing austerities, by scrutinizingly studying, even memorizing the Vedic literatures. by engaging in fantastic charitable acts. The path of perfection can only be achieved by following in the footsteps of the great souls. And of these Mahajans, there are 12 that have especially been referred to in Srimad Bhagavatam. Bhishma Dev is one of these twelve Mahajans. By studying his life, his devotion, and especially this particular chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam, we can understand what is expected of us by the Lord. This section of Srimad Bhagavatam begins by revealing the greatness of Maharaj Yudhisthira. The battle of Kurukshetra has ended. The Pandavas were victorious. And Krishna himself oversaw the coronation of King Yudhisthira as the grand emperor of the entire world. After doing so, Krishna performed his work. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna had spoken, Paritranaya sadhunam vinashaya chuduskritam dharma samstapanarathaya sambhavami juge juge. That again and again he descends into this world to protect the pious. In this case, his beloved devotees, the Pandavas, to annihilate the miscreants, the Kurus headed by Duryodhana, Hare Krishna, and to reestablish the principles of religion. Now that Krishna felt that all the living beings within this entire planet were properly situated under a compassionate, God-conscious king like Yudhisthira. He bid farewell to all the citizens of Hastinapur and was about to return to his own kingdom of Dwaraka. But at that time, Queen Kunti 
she came running before him, begging him to stay. She praised Krishna with such heartfelt devotional prayers that for the last 5,000 years, the greatest of all acharyas have worshipped her by reciting her prayers and learning how to achieve the perfection of life by doing so. Queen Kunti, she considered that dangerous calamities and impossible obstacles were great blessings. Because in such a helpless condition, one realizes there's nothing I can do to save myself. And in that state, wholeheartedly, with fixed attention, turn to Krishna and seek shelter. When we seek shelter in Krishna, we never again have to see the miseries of birth and death. She offered her heart, her soul, and her life in her prayers. As Krishna was just about to leave, Maharaj Yudhisthira approached him. He was depressed, drowning in an unfathomable ocean of lamentation. Why? Usually if you win a war and you're coronated as king and you have no more enemies, no more obstacles, everything he was supposed to do in life he had achieved. Why was he depressed? Because of his very soft heart. He blamed himself for all the suffering and bloodshed that took place on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. Millions and millions of people were killed. And far more millions of people who survived had to suffer the death of their loved ones. There would become millions of widows without a husband to protect them. Millions of fathers and mothers weeping and crying at the loss of their beloved children. Millions and millions of children who are now fatherless. He considered that if this war was really fought for religious principles of a kshatriya, then there would be no blame on himself. But because he considered that he so much wanted to sit on the throne, the ulterior purpose of his own desire was the cause of this war and all of this death and suffering. This is the quality of a great soul. Common people never want to take serious blame for anything, even if they're guilty. One of the primary reasons that people criticize, blaspheme, and try to tear down others is envy. People fail, and they want to blame other people. And they get solace by condemning people who are successful. That is the lower nature of a human being. For little things and big things, it's very difficult for the false ego to accept, I am to blame, it is my fault. We want to transfer the blame to someone else. And even if, 
just to show that we're actually humble souls, we take blame for something, there's usually so many clauses. Yes, I'm to blame, but what do you expect? Because this person did that and that person did this and I had to be in this situation and what could I do? Even though I was wrong, what else could I do? That is a conditioned soul who has false ego. Srila Prabhupada explains that the false ego is the root cause of all suffering and bondage. And yet we are so protective to defend our false ego. That is maya, illusion. That very thing that transcendentalists are trying to destroy, the false ego, which is the root cause of all bondage and suffering, which is the only thing that, that blocks us from our relationship with God. Devotees understand that this false ego is my very worst enemy. And yet the whole world, everyone, is staking their lives to defend and protect their false egos from feeling pain. Hare Krishna. A devotee wants to destroy it. We're willing to declare war or make enemies, even with our own loved ones, if they just give one pinprick to our false ego. What a shining example Yudhisthira Maharaj is. He was absolutely faultless. Not only in the eyes of the great sages, but in the eyes of God, he was faultless. Yet he took all fault upon himself. This is a lesson. If we actually want to be Krishna conscious, we must understand this principle. He was taking the blame for everything he didn't do. And we want to give the blame to everything we did do. That is the difference between material life and spiritual consciousness. In the 15th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, it is explained that di the difference between material world and spiritual world is like a banyan tree standing beside a lake. What is the top of the banyan tree is the bottom of the banyan tree in the reflection. Humility is considered a great weakness in this material world. To be without pride and ego. But in spiritual consciousness, this is a great strength. Actually, just as Krishna bewildered Arjuna in order to speak the Bhagavad Gita to all the world, Krishna bewildered Yudhisthira to think he was responsible for everything. And not only to say it, but be, to, to be beside himself in grief, lamenting piteously. Can you imagine? Such a sensitive, soft-hearted person as Yudhisthira. If he were to mistreat even one common person, it would have pained his heart intensely. And he's thinking about his teachers, his grandfathers, his relatives, his friends, the greatest generals and powerful leaders of the, of, of the societies of the world, all dead because of him. Krishna put him in that situation because he wanted to teach the whole world the greatness of Bhishma Dev. Krishna could have preached to Yudhisthira Maharaj and alleviated all of his anguish. 
But Krishna directed Yudhisthira Maharaj to have a procession to Kurukshetra to hear from his grandfather, Bhishma. The nature of God's love is very personal. Just like in this world, a loving father or mother is happier to see their child glorified than themselves. That is love. Krishna is the supreme father and mother of all living beings. He takes greater pleasure seeing his devotee glorified than he himself being glorified. So by Krishna's direction, there was a procession. He had Yudhisthira and the Pandavas in the most opulent, exquisite, royal clothes, magnificent golden chariots with the finest horses, all the regality that was available on earth as the emperor of the earth was especially prepared for this procession to Kurukshetra. Yudhisthira and the Pandavas, it is compared in the Bhagavatam, he looked like Kuvera, the wealthiest treasurer of all the demigods with his associates, such opulence. Why did Krishna arrange it like that? For the pleasure of his devotee. Because Krishna knew Bhishma's heart. Bhishma loved the Pandavas. From the very beginning of their lives, he longed for Yudhisthira Maharaj to be the emperor. And how Bhishma Practically as much as Kunti, Bhishma had to suffer seeing the Pandavas persecuted, exiled, blasphemed, running for their lives, in danger at every step. And due to political reasons, Bhishma had to fight against them in the battle. Why? That's a very deep subject. On one level, Yudhisthira was showing the world the principle of loyalty. Because he was the grandfather it was by ultimately his authority that the Kurus and the Pandavas were to take over the throne. And somehow or other, due to the envious techniques of the Kurus, Duryodhana and Dhritarashtra were the kings. Now it is the principle that all citizens should be loyal to the king. I and mean, he's a Mahajan. What he does, everyone will follow. So he showed that principle of being loyal to the king who is maintaining them. But on the side, at every step, he was instructing and chastising Dhritarashtra and Duryodhana about the real position and how they should give the kingdom over to Yudhisthira Maharaj, who was the true heir. He was constantly preaching to them, constantly trying to improve their mentality, but publicly, he was loyal to the king. But in his heart of hearts, even though he was the commander in chief of the Kuru army, his desire 
was that he lose and that Yudhisthira be king. Krishna is within the heart of all living beings. The whole world can misunderstand Bhishma, but Krishna knew his heart. And actually, in the end, that's all that matters, is that Krishna is satisfied with us. Whatever the world thinks, however the world may misunderstand, if Krishna is satisfied, our life is perfect. And Krishna was so satisfied with Bhishma Dev that he was going to stand before him at the time of his death just to make Yudhisthira blissful in his last moments. He wanted Yudhisthira to see this glorious occasion where the Pandavas, with the opulences of the emperor of the world, he was going to see them in that condition. It was the dream of his life coming true. Yes, they decorated themselves in this royal procession simply for the pleasure of Bhishma. And Srila Prabhupada also explains another reason why Bhishma took the side of the enemy of God even though he was a pure devotee of God, was it was Krishna's arrangement. Bhishma was Krishna's puppet, willing to endure all difficulties, even willing to be criticized and misunderstood for all time to come, if it would serve Krishna's plan. How many of us are willing to do that? because Krishna wanted to show the world Bhishma was the ultimate warrior in the world. Such a powerful warrior that even the demigods honored him. Krishna wanted to teach that even the greatest, most undefeatable powerful of all warriors must be defeated if they are not on the side of God and his devotees. This story is so instructive. Sometimes devotees get in difficult situations and we think, why is God doing this to me? Maybe it's because of our karma. But even if it's because of our karma, if we just remain faithful, Krishna transforms a curse into a blessing. It's not that Krishna just immediately, apparently, protected the Pandavas. Year after year after year, they were losing everything. They go to the house of lack. It was Bhishma and Vidura that sent him the message, get out of there. It's going to be burned. They had to escape underground like rats. Yes? Who moves around under the ground? Snakes and rats. And in the cities of, of the world, there are subways where almost everybody is doing it. <laughs> it's very prestigious to be traveling underground. This was like the world's first subway system. <laughs> Bhima was secretly digging underground a tunnel to a long distance away where they escaped and as the house was burning. They were running for their lives. Bhima was fed poisonous cakes, was on the verge of death. Then they were cheated in that dice game and exiled to the forest. Draupadi was on the verge of being utterly humiliated. For 14 years. 12 years and an extra year, actually, the Pandavas 
We're in exile, living in the forest with nothing. And meanwhile, Duryodhana was ruling over the entire world with Dhritarashtra. And can you imagine? They had to control over all the propaganda that the world was hearing. Just like during the emergency, during the time of Indira Gandhi in India, she took control over the media and only what she wanted to be said was in the newspapers, in the magazines, in the radios, in the televisions. Anything she did not want to be said, however true it was, was banned. And anything she wanted to be said, however fictitious it was, was what the whole world heard. That's the power of a king. Can you imagine when Durya, Duryodhana and Dhritarashtra were ruling the entire world and the Pandavas were alone in exile with no influence over anyone? Nobody even knew where they were? What kind of lying, horrible propaganda they were making against the Pandavas? And their poor mother, Kunti, was just sitting home, weeping and crying, not even knowing where her children were or if they were still alive. And Bhima, who is Brikodar, whose hunger is like a hungry wolf, he never had enough to eat. And that was a serious problem for Bhima. <laughs> We la you're laughing. He was not laughing. He was hungry. They would have to go out and collect food from the jungle. They were supposed to be eating on golden plates in a palace, and they were just collecting herbs. Can you imagine Bhima eating herbs? They would collect. There was Draupadi, Arjun, Yudhisthir, Nakula, Sahadev, six of them. They would divide it in half. Five of them would eat one half and Bhima would eat the other half. <laughs> and he was never satisfied. Serious. Now the Pandavas could have said, why is God doing this to us? But they had such complete faith in the Lord. And they did not know the future, what would come. But Krishna's promise is that he protects his devotee. How he protects his devotee, that is sometimes inconceivable. Sometimes on the plane of this temporal existence, it appears that we're absolutely without protection. But in the end, Krishna will transform that whole situation into one that will bring us back to the spiritual world. If we just learn to thank God, even for the inconceivable conditions of life. So Krishna wanted to show the world this. That even the greatest, most powerful people, they cannot win in the end, if they are against the side of God. And even if you're absolutely outnumbered, Srila Prabhupada explains from Ramayan that Ravana, he had a massive army of trained warriors with the most sophisticated weapons of the day, more sophisticated than anything today. We have our torpedoes and nuclear bombs. They had brahmastras. <laughs> and the Vanaram army, just a gang of monkeys, all they had was some clubs. And they picked up stones and threw them. Ram wanted to show the world that if you're on his side, even if everything's against you, in the end, you're going to win. But in the middle phase, 
Sita was abducted. Why? It seems impossible. In the middle stage, Prahlad was thrown into all kinds of most calamitous conditions. But if we're faithful to the Lord as his devotees, in the end we will win. And what does it mean to win? To go back home, back to Godhead. Winning in this world doesn't mean everything, because in the end, you all, everyone loses to death. Yes? You're a champion one day, and then you're just an old guy who can't even walk the next day. Yes? That's the way time is. In the end, everyone loses in this world to death, except a devotee, because a devotee attains eternal life with Krishna. That is victory. When they arrived in Kurukshetra, they came to Bhishma, who was lying in a bed of arrows. During the war, by his own will, he was defeated in such a way that the world has never seen. From his neck to his toes, his body was pierced with arrows. Not ordinary arrows, Arjuna's arrows. They went right through the front and out from the back of his body. And there were so many arrows, you could not even put a single finger between any two of them. His body wasn't touching the ground. It was elevated by the arrows. Can you imagine? We get one little thorn in our foot during Parikrama, and we complain so bitterly, why is Krishna doing this to me? I paid my yatra fees. I'm chanting my 16 rounds. I'm following the four regulative principles. I'm praying at all the temples. Why? What have I done to deserve this thorn in my foot? Even some blood is coming out. But Bhishma did not complain. He just laid there silently, waiting. Bhishma had the benediction. He would only die at his own will. Why didn't he die? Bhishma lived a life where he saw so many tragedies, so many injustices. He suffered. He suffered bitterly. Seeing the envy and the greed of his own grandchildren, the Kurus, he suffered bitterly to see the ignorant foolishness of Dhritarashtra and how much he suffered to see the most beloved people in his whole life, the Pandavas, being persecuted and exiled, and Kunti weeping practically all day, every day. And he could die any time. He wasn't attached to his body. Why did he go on living? Srila Prabhupada explains, only for one reason. He knew without doubt that in due course of time, Yudhisthira would be the king. He knew without doubt because they were great devotees of Krishna, in the end they would be exalted. And he lived just to see that day. Yudhisthira Maharaj, Arjun, Bhima, 
Nakula Sahadev, and Krishna himself all bowed down to Bhishma. Why Krishna's bowing down? The Pandavas bowed down because Bhishma was their grandfather and best friend. Krishna didn't have any family relationship with Bhishma. Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He bowed down for several reasons. One, to show etiquette. That because Bhishma was in such a senior position, and he was such a senior person, it is the proper etiquette for everyone, no matter how important or great you may be, to honor your superiors. And also, Krishna wanted to show how he honors and worships his devotees. He bowed down with love. Then an assembly of so many exalted personalities came to the scene. Because Bhishma was not an ordinary man. The qualities of his life were so famous that the principal demigods were coming. Not only that, but all the great sages and rishis. Vyasdev, Asita, Devala, Bhardraj Muni, Parvat Muni, Narada Muni, Shukadev Goswami. And all these great persons came because they wanted to render some service and offer their honor to Bhishma at the, uh, at the moment of his greatest need. And Bhishma Dev, he welcomed everyone with such a gracious demeanor. And Srila Prabhupada explains in this regard that a great personality will perform his service or her service according to time, place, and circumstance. Now, obviously, in such a situation, Vyasdev, Sukadev Goswami, Narada Muni, Parvat Muni, Bhardraj Muni, Asita Dev, all these great sages, Vashishta Muni, Vishwamitra Muni, Parasaram, his own guru, you get up, you welcome them, you offer them a seat, you give them some water. But Bhishma was unable to get up. He was unable to do anything. But with his gracious heart, simply by his glance and his kind words, he gave a perfect welcoming to all of them. Such a cultured gentleman he was in every respect. Bhishma looked at Krishna who was sitting next to him and a little distance away was Yudhisthira and the Pandavas sitting silently, grieving to see the condition of their grandfather. This is also very special too. Yudhisthira was fighting against the Kurus and the commander-in-chief of the army of their enemy was Bhishma. But yet, throughout, the Pandavas considered Bhishma after Krishna to be their very intimate best friend and well-wisher. Is that an ordinary thing for your best friend, your well-wisher, the person who loves you the most? to be on the side of your enemy, organizing all of their phalanxes to destroy you? Hare Krishna. Because the Pandavas knew Bhishma's heart. They knew why he was fighting on the other side, and they loved him. To them, losing Bhishma was losing their dearest relative and their dearest friend. Seeing him in that condition was unbearable for the Pandavas. 
And Bhishma began to speak. Oh, what terrible sufferings the Pandavas have endured, he began. The Pandavas, they did not deserve such suffering. From their very childhood, they were put into inconceivable arrangements. Why? And look at Kunti, the mother, how much she had to suffer. Yudhisthira is the very personification of religious principles. He's the son of Dharmara. Absolutely pious and perfect in every way. Why was he put into so many miserable conditions? And Arjuna, the greatest of all warriors with his Gandiba bow, and Bhima, the most powerful man alive with his club, and Krishna is their best well-wishing friend and protector. Why were they put into such terrible sufferings? In my opinion, Bhishma said, it is the force of inevitable time. That force of inevitable time is controlling all the planets within the universal creation. Just like clouds are blown by the wind. Just like the planets are floating in the air, similarly everything in creation is being controlled by inevitable time, which is the representative of Krishna within his creation. Srila Prabhupada in this regard explains how this power of inevitable time is so inconceivable because it is controlled by God himself. Therein, Srila Prabhupada says, in this material world, everyone has to suffer. People with sinful karma have to suffer their bad karma. But even people with very, very excellent, pure karma have to suffer if they're in this material world. That is stated by Krishna, who is the creator of this world. Abrama bhuvana loka punar avartha norjana mamu konteya punar janmana vidyate From the highest planet in this material world, Brahma loka, is there any sinful people in Brahma loka? If there's even a speck of sin in your heart, you cannot go to Brahmaloka. That's the ultimate planet for the pious. There is Bhuloka, Bhuvarloka, Janaloka, uh, Maharloka, Tapaloka, Satyaloka, or Brahmaloka, where people live for billions of years. There's no disease. There's no old age. When your time's up, you just leave. You don't have to grow old and die like here. You just have to leave. You die, but it's, it's not that you get cancer. It's not that you have a heart failure. It's not that you know, your kidneys stop working. You just live a beautiful, opulent life, and when your time's up, you're gone. Even in Brahma Loka, Krishna says, it is a place of misery. What to speak of Patala Loka? And what to speak of Bua and Bhuvar Loka, where we live, which is somewhere in between? Of 
Krishna tells us in Gita. And we should take it seriously. Dukalayam Ashashvatam. He certifies this material world is a miserable place because everything is temporary, wherever you are. Whatever arrangement you make, even if you make an arrangement to become Lord Brahma, still you have to suffer. You can't be in the ocean and not be wet. You can't be in the material world and not suffer. Whoever you are, wherever you are, even if you're the most pious, even if you do yajyas and Vishnu Sahasranams 20 times a day, even if you do Satya Narayan pujas, and <laughs> even if you give your best diamond ring to Balaji and Tirupati, even if you, even if you offer uh, mountains of grains to the Brahmins, still you have to suffer. Even if you chant 16 rounds every day, <laughs> still you have to suffer. But for a devotee who's chanting 16 rounds every day, the suffering makes them chant more seriously. <laughs> Without suffering, it would be very mechanical. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. Hare. Suffering helps us. That's why Kunti prayed for suffering. It helps me intensely focus my mind exclusively only on you, Krishna. Let the sufferings come. So sufferings are inevitable. Why are sufferings inevitable in this world? Dukalayam Shashwatam. Because everything's temporary. Why is everything temporary? Because everything is under the control of Krishna in the form of inevitable time. Srila Prabhupada says, even the pious have to suffer. But there's a difference. In the world of suffering, padam padam yadvipadam natesham, where there's danger at every step, and that doesn't mean there's not danger at every step after you take initiation. Some people think, let me just take initiation, then all dangers will be gone. But ask some people who have been initiated and <laughs> you will be enlightened. Dangers are there for everybody. They were there for Prahlad, they were there for the Pandavas, they were there for Haridas Thakur, they were there for Jesus Christ, they were there for uh, Ambarish Maharaj. They were there for Srila Prabhupada, for Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, for Bhakti Vinod Thakur. He had mystic yogis who had powers trying to kill him and his whole family. His children had fevers. His wife was sick. Just let this man go. He said, no, I will die. My whole family will die, but he will not cheat anyone. I have faith in Krishna. Arivo. Dangers are there for everyone. But Srila Prabhupada explains the sufferings and dangers when they come to a devotee, they they help the devotee to surrender to Krishna with deeper humility and intense devotion. They understand the necessity. Parikshit Maharaj was a great devotee. From the time he was in the womb of his mother, he had the darshan of Krishna directly. And his whole life was dedicated to Krishna. But what was the culmination of his career when he was cursed to die in seven days? No, this Puniyatra is four days. <laughs> That's over half the lifespan of Parikshit's remaining life. It's not very long. But even though he was a great devotee, when he received that miserable condition to die, to die means he was still young. No more wife. No more children. No more palace. No more his present service to Krishna. No more body. 
But in that suffering, he intensely surrendered to Krishna. He focused his entire energy on hearing Krishna Katha from Shukadev Goswami. His mind did not waver. Even after several days passed with no food and no water, 